to Multifamily Investing Made Simple, the podcast where we take the complexity out of real estate investing so that uh, you, the person listening to this, can take some action today. I'm your host, Anthony Vecino of Invictus Capital, joined by Dan. Mm. I'm also here, Kruger. I am present. <laughs> present and accounted for. Mm. Uh, we're doing roll call. So if you are here listening to this right now, you need to check in by going over to iTunes and dropping a review um, and hitting subscribe while you're at it. And that's the episode. I think we just came in. We just do a, a pitch for a, an yeah, ask for a review and then we just bounce out of here. Yep. No. Okay. We're not going to do that. We're going to bring some more value than that. Hopefully. What are we doing here today? We're talking books. Uh, that's talking right. A really good book actually. That's right. By my boy. Your home, your home, your home sauce. Yeah. I mean, we go way back. Do you? No, we haven't met, but I've been consuming his content for a long time. I feel like I could hang out with this guy. Oh, um, yeah. And have a good time. I feel like him and I could go for a motorcycle <laughs> trip and it'd be, it'd be a hoot. Yeah. No, this guy's, you could tell he's fun. Actually, after reading this book, I, I went to um, one of my good friends and I was like, dude, I want to go on a motorcycle trip. Yeah. Cause, Cause he does a motorcycle trip every year. And I'm like, oh, that sounds like a lot of fun. Who else did that? Jim, Jim Rogers, I think went on this like kind of world tour. Who's Jim Rogers? Uh, he's that guy in a bow tie. Um, oh, yeah, oh, was, in the white. That was in a seersucker. Seersucker. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he did it. I think he had some kind of like Mercedes motorcycle, this big kind of thing that could fit him and his wife with this little Mercedes trailer on it. I mean, it was a very. Sounds like a car. Did basically he have a car? a car <laughs> that you drive like a motorcycle. Right? Okay. Okay. But, That's fine. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was definitely the bougie way to go on a motorcycle. If you're going to go on a motorcycle trip, you might as well bougie. Yeah. So that's, that's been my experience. I did, I, I, when I lived in California, I had a motorcycle and, um, it always struck me by how cold you could get, um, on your motorcycle in really mild temperatures. So like if it was like 60 degrees, 50 degrees, it's freezing. We would go up to the Sierra sometimes and it would just like, you just be iced to the core. So like, I think I'm maybe too soft to do like a tour of cold States, but I could that's do hot you gotta States. Just drape yourself in leather. I think that's, Oh, I was draped. Reason. I was what, draped. What is it like if you're if it's like sixty degrees out and you're going like sixty miles an hour? What is it? What's like the wind chill? It feels it's like, like thirty. Yeah. I'll tell you that. Like it, and you have no exposure and your chest is just getting blasted. And I don't care how much leather you're wearing, it's not enough. So <laughs> and your fingers are going cold because you can't wear mittens. Well, I guess you can't. They do have mittens you could wear. You'd Anyways, be shunned from the biker community. I think if you were. They're pants. like, well, get this man out of here. <laughs> I was never really um, indoctrinated into the cycling community, so. Uh, I don't think that would be an issue for me, but <laughs> all right, let's talk about this book. So let's this book to, what's that? I said, let's do it. Okay. Oh, for the record, it's called, am I being too subtle by Sam Zell? Sam Zell. We've been beating around the bush with what the actual book is. Yeah. Sam so. Zell is this legendary figure in the real estate investing world. He's, he's an old fart now and he's known for being uh, abrasive, blunt to the point, doesn't dance around things. And, um, he's been doing this shindig for, God, since the 50s or 60s? It was 60s. Yeah, he, he's been in the game for a long time. He's seen a lot of ups and downs. He's known for having some pretty good timing mm -hmm. on things. He, I, I believe he created, if not the first, I believe it was the first, REIT, and then sold it to Blackstone, which is really interesting because I was also reading What It Takes by Stephen Schwartzman. He, he mentioned Sam, Sam Zell because their lives intersected at an interesting point, and Blackstone ended up buying that portfolio uh, Sam Zell's portfolio. I want to say it was like 2006, 2007. Yeah, it was like right before, right before the crash. Yeah. But even then, like that whole transaction is fascinating because it was, I think it was like 25, 30 billion dollar transaction, and they worked it out with Sam where they could start selling the assets before they closed, so that they could line up the sale of uh, half the portfolio the day that they closed. The acquisition. So they bought the whole portfolio for say, let's say 30 billion. They arranged to sell off half the buildings and they only wanted to keep the jewels and that, that half they sold for like 15 billion or something like that. So right there, they just like decreased their basis by, mm -hmm. by half. And it was like this big coup. It was a great deal. Yeah. Yeah. And then less than a year later, I think is when things went off the tracks. So yeah, I think Blackstone ended up still doing pretty well on this because they, their, their basis was so low at that point. Yeah. They know what they're doing. Yeah, they, they did good. So, or, I mean, if you believe Stephen Schwartzman in, I mean, in his perspective. Sam did the best. But Sam did pretty good because yeah. he got out at the top. Yep. And <laughs> he, got, he, got he got at the very top. So he's a very interesting guy. Um, there's a lot to learn in this book. I think if you want to be a real estate investor or an entrepreneur, there's just a lot of really good takeaways here because 
Uh, Sam does not strike me as a very complicated guy, uh, or at least that's his persona. He tries to keep things simple. And that's one of my critiques of this book too, is his oversimplification of certain things. And we can talk about that as we get to it. But uh, what do you say? You want to you wanna kick us off? Or? Let's do it. All right, what do, you, what do you got? What's number one? What's your number one takeaway? Oh, and by the way, for listeners that are like, what is this podcast episode? This is where we take a book that we think is like super great, but we're trying to save you some time so that you don't have to read the whole thing. And we're going to compile our top 10 takeaways, five from Dan, five from me. We're going to put them together into a sheet called the philosopher or the sophisticated investor notes. And then if you want a copy of that, just shoot us an email, anthony at invictusmultifamily.com. I'll send you the link to that folder. And I think there's at this point almost 10 mm. books that we've done. And so just try to save you time so that you don't have to go read these books. But if you want to, I, I would recommend still picking this one up. There's some good stories in there. 10 a good number. All right. So what's your, what's your number one? Number and this one is not necessarily no like your best. particular order, just the order I wrote them down, uh, was the concept of being a grave dancer. Uh, he talks about this pretty early in the book. And uh, basically what being a grave dancer is, is almost kind of like circling your prey, more or less. Um, kind of knowing what you're going after and really focusing on those, I guess, you know, distressed assets is really what he was looking at. Distressed existing assets so that when the time is right, um, he could pop in and get something at a, a really great price, specifically a price well below replacement cost. And... Um, focusing on, on distressed value add deals. Uh, he did a brief deviation where he started to uh, do a little bit in the de development space after starting in management, moving into acquiring existing assets, deviated over into development, realized that, hey, the risk reward scenario is actually pretty skewed over here. I can buy a distressed existing asset for well below replacement cost, add value, uh, increase the value just like we do with apartment buildings, and still be below replacement cost, or I could go develop a new thing uh, that's going to take a year to get up and running, and I am acquiring it basically at replacement cost. So it doesn't really leave a lot of cushion there. So his thing is very closely aligned to us, which is to be opportunistic, um, and when there is trouble or you know blood in the streets or distress, um, having cash on hand, like we kind of alluded to with that Blackstone sale, is great. So you can jump in there and get these... Uh, extremely discounted, typically distressed assets at a really good basis, even all in after you invest your capital to beef them up and make them better, you're still in there at less than replacement cost. So being a grave dancer, I like just because it it aligned with, with our style, kind of confirmed that, okay, this guy that's been active since the 60s up through today is able to say that, yeah, this is actually a really good approach. Uh, new development's great, sexy, but find an existing thing that you can go into and, and add value to that's um, that's his forte and it's ours too. So I liked reading about that and getting confirmation because mm -hmm. we've looked a lot at development too. It's one of those things yeah. that's attractive, but yeah, you've probably heard us if you listen to the podcast over a long enough time frame. We've come in and out of periods where we're looking at development, we want to get into it, but it's all about finding the right partnership and like we don't know anything about it, so we got to have a good partner who has operational experience. But then. Then you hear stories like from Sam where it's like, hey, he dove, he dove into it and he was much larger than us. Mm -hmm even when he dove into it and eventually went away from it. Cause he's like, it's just complex and risky and like, not, not the focus. It takes you away from where he was really excelling. And so I think that's a really good takeaway in general, which is if you have something that's working, keep doing the thing that's working. Mm -hmm. And at his core, the, I think Sam's whole philosophy of being a grave dancer is like, um, in alignment with the Benjamin Graham, Warren Buffett thesis of like value investing, buying something below its intrinsic value, which is what the, the replacement cost is a way of trying to calculate that and saying like, okay, if we took this building away, what would it take to rebuild it? And as long as there's still like, and here's my number one takeaway. As long as there's still strong demand, you know, it, that replacement cost can be a very good benchmark. So my takeaway here was fundamentals win. He talks about this in multiple points where his pretty much his entire thesis is born off the back of really simple economic principles like supply and demand liquidity equals value good corporate governance and reliable partners so like th th those were like four takeaways that i had from the book where i was like yeah i mean if you just do the basics if you're always on the right side of the supply demand curve it's really hard to go wrong there two liquidity is very valuable in the sense that you can't dance on other people's grave if you don't have the money to get into the cemetery, 
right? I don't know if they charge if there's a bouncer and you got to like, you know, grease his palms. But like the whole premise is uh, you can't be in the grave with them. So well, you, you have to be in a grave. position. Yeah. Yeah. You have to, you have to be able to buy a coffin, I it's guess, cash. or something. So you got to have liquidity. Um, Good corporate governance. This is something that he mentioned in particular, but never really talked about in depth. And this is like one of my big uh, issues with the book is that a lot of what Sam talks about is like, oh, I saw the right opportunity. I was okay with the risk. I assessed it correctly. And you read about it and it's like, and then next thing you know, we we were running this massive company and blah, blah, blah. And then we did this other thing. We had a massive company. And he never really talks about the operations mm. at all. Like he, he really never talks about, he talks a little bit about culture, but he never talks about the operations and how difficult that aspect of anything really is. He just kind of, he just kind of mentions, oh, I took a risk, saw an opportunity, like it worked, worked out really well. And you're like, okay, how? <laughs> and it's relationships he's talking about. Yeah. And and I wish you would have gone deeper into it because as an operator ourselves, I think that's where the real meat is. But I can also understand like for a book like this, that's trying to uh, appeal to the general masses. Maybe most people don't care about that. Mm -hmm. They just want to hear like the cool, sexy stories. Yeah, no, I think that makes a lot of sense. And that, that really kind of aligns with that, that Blackstone sale that we were talking about before at the peak of the market. And I was going to get to this uh, a little bit later, but no, this actually is number two that I've written down, which oh, is boom. block out the noise. Um, Cause once he has a quote in there and I might be butchering this a little bit, I tried to write it down, but um, once I have formed my opinion, I have to trust my perspective enough to act on it. This means putting my own money behind it and my level of commitment is high. So he'll listen to other people. And like we kind of mentioned here, there's a lot of talk about relationships and to build anything as large as he did, you've got to have a really big team there. And so he's got a lot of people advising him on what to do. But what he does is he forms his thesis. He'll listen to people. Um, but his, his thesis is the main thing that he is entrusting. And he, he gets there by uh, focusing on the basics, supply and demand. Specifically in real estate, he's looking at the supply of units, whether it's office units or apartment units or whatever that's in an area and the demand. And so the reason he's able to exit at that time with Blackstone was because he was looking at the stuff that mattered. He was blocking out the noise. Everyone else was um, euphoric and, and, and trudging forward, thinking things were never going to uh, adjust or, or, or go downward. He looked at supply and demand and saw that that, that was uh, out of equilibrium or was getting to equilibrium. There was not an imbalance. There was not a, a lack of supply and an outsized portion of demand that went away and he decided to exit because he blocked out the noise, didn't listen to all the short term thinkers. He had his thesis and he focused on the focuses on the basics. So number two takeaway for me is block out the noise. It's usually the emotional stuff that pops up short term, getting caught up in the, the hollow blue. But if you've got your, your <clears throat> excuse me, your, your basic first principles that you're looking at, you can keep it simple, keep the motion out of it and just stick to your game plan. Yeah, I think that the difficulty for most is uh, separating the signal from the noise and understanding of all the chatter out there. What are the relevant pieces that are going to inform your thesis and what's what's superfluous? And I think right now where we are in the world um, and all the news that you hear about, you know, Ukraine, let's say, or interest rates or inflation, and like all of these things. And how do they all come together? And like what's noise? What's meaningful in the last two years with COVID and everything associated with that? there's been a lot of noise and it can be very, very difficult to, to know in the moment. And a lot of times like you're, you just have to have your best judgment and make a, a decision off of a framework, hopefully that you've established prior. And then you're only going to retroactively be able to look back and really be able to say, okay, how was this the right decision? Maybe not like maybe, maybe even in the future, you won't be able to t say that for certain, but I think it's helpful to in that, that vein, stay the course figure out like what's your, your thesis and stay the course, mm -hmm. which kind of ties into um, my, my fifth one. So I'm just going to skip ahead here, which oh, is geez. that opportunity means nothing if you don't pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the one of the really interesting things I've, I'm seeing right now, like on Twitter is everybody talking about like using the Warren Buffett quotes about, uh, and I think this is actually a Rothschild quote initially, which is when there's blood in the street, be greedy. Uh, or like when others are being fearful, be greedy. When others are being greedy, be fearful. And they're throwing that around as though like they're they're trying to prep everybody mentally, saying like, "Oh, it's coming. The buying time is coming." But we're and I, I keep chiming into the conversations, and I'm like, "Why do you think it's coming 
and not that it's already here. Like all these prices are dropping. If you thought they were a good value six or nine or 10 months ago, why wouldn't they be a good value now? And people are like, well, I still think they have further to go. And I'm like, hey, you're exactly the person Warren Buffett's talking about. Like you're fearful that if you buy now, you're gonna miss the bottom later. And so instead of just buying all the way down and back up and like, you know, always being in the market, you're just sitting out. And so I find it interesting because when Sam Zell sold his portfolio, you could look at that and be like, that was a great decision to sell. But most people wouldn't have done it because they would have been like, ah, I bet it can go a little bit further. It's a little bit further. And so if you don't capitalize on the opportunity by actually taking action, then it doesn't matter if you were right, if you didn't do anything with it. Yeah, that's huge. I mean, paper profits are meaningless, right? Yeah. And the risk reward starts to change a lot on that. I mean, if you, let, let's say for this, um, I think it was office equity REIT, is what it was called, or, or something like that. Um, let's just say he was, he had that portfolio for, I don't remember how long he'd, he'd had it, but he's been building it for a long time and he'd already made a lot of his money, uh, that he was going to make there. And so you got to ask yourself how much more upside does this have and how much downside does it have now? And it's a lot different risk reward than it was years prior when there was a bunch of potential upside and the downside was pretty limited because you hadn't made that much. Once you've accumulated all these paper profits, you're effectively risking everything you've made to maybe get another couple percentage points there. It's going to go a little bit more. It's like, what's the point? So that's why you got to cut out the noise, ignore those short-term thinkers. All those people on Twitter are, are just short-term. I mean, if we're looking at things in, a, in decades instead of years, it doesn't matter where the bottom is, right? You don't need to catch the bottom. No one catches it. My next takeaway is completely Completely unrelated to that. It's nice <laughs> Hard to time together, but uh, Shem Tov. Uh, it's a Hebrew uh, term for uh, a good name. And so he talks about this, and this aligns with our core values and, and how we operate. Um, this is basically saying that your reputation is everything, regardless of the business you're in. It could be real estate, it could be just life in general or, or any industry. Your reputation is everything. Everything you say and you do goes on your permanent record. That was something he said in the book as well. And that it's a key takeaway for me because it's, it, it is everything in real estate for sure. And definitely in other businesses, but in real estate, especially it's all about those reputation or all, all about those relationships you have and that reputation that you can build up over a long period of time. It's very easy to destroy that. So you've got to be clear on your values and your morals and stick to those. And, uh, that's, that was clear in, in the book that a lot of what Sam Zell talks about can tie right back to just some really basic fundamental core values that he holds true. And one of them was uh, Shem Tov, your reputation. It's everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the value of your name mm -hmm. is, it, it's it's your brand, it's your, it's irreplaceable. Yeah. And only got one. Yeah, and it, it sucks. Um, if, if you tarnish it, if you do something, and it's really easy to tarnish your, your, your name, really easy. Um, and it takes a long time to rebuild. And I'm sure we've all been there at, you know, when we're young, when done things in our life where it's like, ooh, I don't really want that attached to my name anymore. And you think about like how long that trailed you, how long it stuck with you in your identity and like the, the relationships that you had and how people interacted with you. So it's double, yeah, I think in, in business where uh, <laughs> people don't forget. Mm -hmm. They do not forget. And it's one of the things that they judge you on. So take, take good, 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 good care of your name. Um, all right, my, my fourth, no, okay, so my, my third one, which is actually my fourth one, which actually ties back to my fifth one, which tied back to your second one. I'm, so I'm bringing lost. it all, I'm bringing it, I'm connecting it. I don't all. feel connected. Okay, well, so you were talking about, um, you know, not trying to catch the bottom because nobody catches it, and then, like, also understanding once that juice has been squeezed, or, no, you don't squeeze juice, I guess. Okay, once that, that orange has been squeezed and you got all the, most of the juice out of it, then is it really worth the effort of continuing to squeeze for a few more drops? Right. Yep. And so this one is tied to that, but it's also tied to something more, even more impactful, which is never risk what you can't afford to lose for something you don't need. Never risk something you can't afford to lose for something you don't need. Sounds very Hermosy-ish. It's, and it might, he might be taken from Sam Zell, but I think the concept is yeah. just, it's so powerful. When you think about Sam Zell selling his portfolio, let's say at the top and like doing really well, he could have risked it and like held onto it for longer and gotten marginally more 
you know, but he's risking potentially losing all that value if in the crash, let's say, for something that he didn't really need, which was just a couple more points, right? And now you could bring this back to your own life. Like, if if you're thinking about passively investing into an apartment syndication and all you have to your name is fifty thousand dollars, like it's it, you can't afford to lose that money. Don't invest it. Don't don't put at risk that which you can't afford to lose. Like. And I think so many people do this unwittingly. They take on debt. Uh, they, they take on expenses and liabilities in their life that they don't realize how risky it is and how they truly do not need it. And what they're really risking, and, and again, like this doesn't even have to be monetary. Let's say like you could be risking your family, your personal health by being a workaholic, mm -hmm. right? Like you're risking your family life and the, the relationships that truly matter for something that you don't really need, which is money or status that comes through work or whatever, right? And so I think that framework is just so powerful to, to think about because I find myself personally going towards that like workaholic and like grind and trying to, to build something meaningful over here while at times risking the things that truly matter, so. I like it, I like it. It ties into a little bit to, to my next one, which was have fun. Um, <laughs> Because you got to be having fun, right? You 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 can't get into any business that you don't genuinely enjoy, um, because the payoffs are not going to be quick and large up front, right? Especially in real estate, it's a slow it's a slow grind, and as uh, someone has said to me many times before, it's a slugfest. You might know who that is. Who, um, who said that? Oh, a certain seller that we transact with a decent amount. Oh, it's a slug. <laughs> I've never heard him say that. He said to me at least a couple times. Oh, um, interesting. But uh, anywho, so he's saving all is, his great deep insights for when I'm not there. Oh yeah, we should do like a an almanac of uh, him. I won't say his name. That'd be great. But we should. There's there's a lot of yeah. I can't there's a lot. Say there. his name. There's a lot of isms that we could we could pull. Um, but anyways, I mean, the, and this aligns with a lot of uh, stuff that uh, Naval Ravikant talks about. Um, we obviously talk a lot about him and his philosophies and really finding your niche in your business that um, both provides you with the outcome or the, the future that you want, but also serves you and, and provides happiness. And that kind of ties back to the point that you were making about, you know, not risking what you can't afford to lose, talking about time with the family and stuff like that. Like you've actually got to enjoy what you're doing and you can't just be focused on the money because the money may or may not come. And if it does come, it's probably gonna come a lot later. And so you've got to like something a lot to be able to work through all of the early years where there really is no payoff. So really enjoying what you're doing is fundamental. So anybody who's starting to get into real estate or anything, you've got to be really honest with yourself and um, really look in the mirror and decide, okay, is this something I genuinely enjoy that I could just do without getting paid for or lose money on for an extended period of time and, and still feel satisfied? Um, so in real estate, that's solving puzzles and problems and putting out fires and dealing with a lot of different balls in the air at one time for the purpose of building something and, and adding value, whatever it is. But you know, there's, there's a lot that you have to deal with and you've got to just really enjoy it. So this one's kind of just like a self-awareness, like make sure that you focus on stuff that matters, having fun, doing stuff that serves you, and then, you know, not risking your, your family to be a workaholic. Um, cause you've actually got to enjoy what you're doing. This is, this is going to be super interesting because I'm about to go the complete opposite direction. And I don't, dis I don't disagree. I, so I don't disagree about having fun. Promoting sadness. Yeah, mean? yeah, promoting <laughs> sadness. I think fun is super necessary. And, but I think you can have fun doing all sorts of things that you don't necessarily enjoy, like, like to do. Like mm -hmm. digging a ditch can be a lot of fun if it's with the right people with the right attitude if you turn it into a game. Like you can make it fun. So my, my takeaway here was a different one from Sam. He says, if you're really good at what you do, you have the freedom to be who you really are. And this this made me think about a book Cal Newport had written called So Good They Can't Ignore You. And in that book, he debunks this idea that we have that you hear from like Steve Jobs and like all these billionaires that are like, go do the th like chase your passion, go pursue the thing that you're passionate about. And then you because if you if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. Right. Like that a whole concept. And his 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 whole thesis in this book was that's actually completely wrong advice. And it's not even the advice that the people who are giving the advice followed Steve jobs as an example, who says like, you know, 
you know, follow your passion, wasn't passionate about computers and he wasn't passionate about phones. He, he was passionate about, you know, design or business. And he used like the computer as an avenue for exploring those things, but it wasn't the computer itself. And so my takeaway here and how to link it back to what you're talking about is even if you don't love real estate and um, like spreadsheets, let's say, if, if you get really good at it, like competence breeds a whole lot of enjoyment. So if you get good at a thing, you tend to like it more. Mm-hmm. And I think that can be a really good barometer in general just to understand like where should you be t- spending your time is like, do I like this thing? Well, that's probably something you have the capacity to get really good at. And I think you should lean into that for sure. But also understand that there's going to be a lot of aspects of what you're doing like day to day, like a lot of what we do. I don't like doing it, but it needs to get done. Mm-hmm. And it's part of the it's part of the uh, the the thing that brings me fulfillment over here. And so all I'm saying is even if you're digging a ditch, you can still have fun, but don't let, don't let chasing just your pure passion and fun be the thing that turns you off and like, cause a lot of people will be like, Oh, this isn't fun. I don't want to do it. It's like, yeah, yeah, you, you, you're you going to have to suck. You're gonna have to get through that period of suck to get to the fun sometimes. Yeah, it's a good point. I think a good example here is like working out. Um, I love working out now, but no one likes it for at least the first few weeks. Like you've got to start seeing some results, whatever your goals are, before you actually start to enjoy it. And then you start to enjoy the process that gets you those results. So I think the whole fun thing you need to look at from probably a higher, more holistic level and say, is the the whole process and what I'm building long term something that makes me happy and that is fun? Because no one likes the day-to-day nitty-gritty stuff of anything they're doing. It's all it's a lot of it's administrative stuff that's just not really serving you, but it's about kind of the bigger picture and what you're building. Um, if you're really psyched on that and having fun building that thing, then yeah, I don't, I don't like arguing with lawyers the day before closing, but doing it. It's the thing that you got to do. Doing it. And, it. and and again, like I, we, we had an interesting conversation with our, with our team yesterday that was really informative about how like we have different worldviews and it's always interesting to, to see how others view the world and then like where you guys diverge. And the, the takeaway for me here is that anything, anything can be made fun. Like any, any task, like even a phone call with a, a grumpy lawyer could be turned into something fun. Mm-hmm. Um, whether you're willing to go to like the, the lengths needed mentally <laughs> to make it fun, that's a different conversation, but you could make it fun. You could. Mm-hmm. So just, just always know you have, the, you have the fun card in your back pocket. Yes. Yeah, it's all about perspective, I think. Yep. Uh, my last one is, uh, start with the basics, um, specifically management, speaking with somebody yesterday, um, who was inquiring about a position in Victus and, uh, talking about, uh, the management team and starting out there is coming in fresh out of school. Um, no experience whatsoever, likes the idea of getting into real estate, but doesn't know exactly what angle he wants to take. I was telling him that a lot of the greats, Sam Zell included started, uh, at like the kind of entry level property management type of role. Um, Sam Zell was managing student housing. That's where he cut his teeth. Ken McElroy, same thing. Ken McElroy's uh, a large uh, real estate. He does what we do. It's just, what is it? Probably like 15,000 some units now or something. He's a big boy. Yeah, he's a big boy. And he started in management. I did it um, unintentionally. Uh, I didn't think I was gonna start in management, but I did. But it's just a really great way to cut your teeth in any industry, specifically real estate. Yeah, you did too. Yep. Everyone did. <laughs> and everyone who really knows it, I think, has done some time there. Yep. Just like everyone, I think, needs to do some time in customer service to be a decent human being. You got to put some time into kind of the basic fundamentals, even if you've got your sights set on an entirely different um, uh, avenue in that industry. But understanding like the boots on the ground level operations of the business that you're trying to build is, I think, imperative. And so he started from uh, property management you know, kind of entry level almost, and pretty much all the greats have, I think, uh, at least to some degree. So I think there's something to be said there. If you're thinking about getting into real estate, don't try to skip all those prerequisites. In my mind, they are prerequisites. You've got to get some experience in that kind of basic boots on the ground, property management level activity, even if you want to just be on the private equity side, raising capital and run around in a suit looking like you're all Wall Street. So. All right. Yeah. Yeah. No, neither does Sam I, Zell. He wears jeans everywhere. I will say I don't have any data to support this, but um, what I'm going to say sounds interesting, and so I'm going to I'm going to lean into it. Is that 
I bet, statistically speaking, the best CEOs of any business are the ones that started in the mail room mm -hmm. and then worked their way up over the course of 15, 20, 30 years. And they like just did every single position in yep. the company. So by the time they were CEO, they have this worldview of how all the parts come together. I, I would take that CEO any day over 100%. somebody that was just, they have had great success in other businesses. They've inserted them like, and honestly, it might just be a wash. Like both might be really good, but there's something just so romantic about the, the CEO who's literally done every role and knows that company like the back of their hand. Mm -hmm. And, and I think this is why startups really struggle a lot when, when the founder finally steps out and they bring in a professional CEO because the founder from the very beginning um, probably bootstrapped it and had to do everything. They had to do the customer service. They had to do the product fulfillment, the product design. They had to do the marketing. They had to do all of it. So they understood how it all came together and worked in a way that, yes, you might have business acumen and understand marketing, product design, customer service, all that stuff, but not in the way that the founder did. And so then in that transition, there's usually like a bumpy path as they, they try to get that figured out. But I think if you want to get into real estate, just understand, like, don't don't try and jump to the front of the queue. Like, you're going to have to put in your reps, put in your time under the bar, and it it sucks. But it's going to be so much more uh, valuable down the road when you are leaning on that knowledge. Mm -hmm. 100%. So. All right, my last one, completely different than any of these other ones. And this is one that uh, strikes near and dear to my heart because Jamie, my girlfriend, always gives me crap about this which is the power of optionality. Specifically, his line was, wait as long as possible to commit to anything. <laughs> and that is me in a nutshell. Um, Jamie knows that I do not commit to things until like the day of, maybe hour before, because um, I don't know. I, I don't wanna make a decision for future Anthony. I don't know what he's gonna wanna do. And I wanna keep that door open and that can be construed as a bad thing of like, oh, you're afraid to commit to things. And I'm like, I'm not afraid. I just, I don't want to be locked in. I want to have the, the option to do something else. And I think this is useful in business and real estate in general, just always, because this is a Nassim Taleb concept of like, optionality is king. The more options that you have in ways of making money with a deal, more ways of exiting the deal profitably, more ways to operate it profitably throughout the life of the hold, the better off you're going to be because regardless of what macro market cycles do to you, you have a plan that can be slotted in to work. And if you only have one plan, one option, and things don't go exactly to that plan, you're dead in the water. Dead. D-E-D. Yeah. -E -D. Dead. Makes sense to me. I think the, uh, maybe not procrastinating, but the delay of locking in a commitment is is wise because I think a lot of people will commit to something sooner putting themselves in a position to have to back out of something they committed to, thus tarnishing their reputation. Whereas if you wait to commit until you're absolutely sure that you can or want to be involved in whatever this thing is, then um, you can actually do what you say, as opposed to backing out, canceling, and trying to flake, or doing what most people do, which is just not coming through on something that they said they were gonna do. So, I like it. Um, I don't know if Jamie likes it, but- um, <laughs> She understands it though. She might not like it, but she understands it. <laughs> and that's the key to a good partnership. All right. So that is the book, Am I Being Too Subtle by Sam Zell. Highly recommend. It's a good book. Um, pretty much gave you all the takeaways here, though, so you don't need to go read it. If you want to read um, our takeaways, then again, shoot me an email, Anthony, at InvictusMultifamily.com, and I'll send you the link so that you can get the sophisticated investor notes. They're very pretty. Reed How much does do a great these job. These are free 99 So that's that a pretty good deal. Three as in one, two, three, ninety-nine. Oh no, I'm sorry. Free with an F R E E ninety-nine. Free ninety-nine. Yeah, we're making no money off of them. This we're just we're just wasting Reed's time uh, creating them. They're very pretty. Uh, They're very useful. Um, we're going out of so business. we get nothing out of this. Yeah, well, it's good for you guys. It's, it's not a good win. for us. We gotta have a we gotta have a meeting about this thing. So. Yeah, we need to find a way to monetize this. So. Um, <laughs> But in the short term, you guys get the benefit. So <laughs> go collect them. Uh, there's a bunch in there. There We've done Traction. We've done the Almanac of Noval Ravikant. We've done $100 million offers by Alex Hermosi. There's a bunch of books in there. So uh, if you want the, the database, the library of notes, just shoot me an email. And uh, in exchange, I guess, what you could do if you feel like it, um, you're reciprocating some value, uh, you could go leave a review. 
you could subscribe to the podcast. You could share it with a friend or a foe. Uh, all those things would be welcome. And we're doing these once a week, right? So every yeah. week that database is going to be just keeps getting bigger. And so bigger, bigger. that's a pretty lucrative little deal. That yeah. Wow. Yeah, we're saving you this tons of time. Think about, okay, so if it takes you, say, five hours to read this book, well, by spending 35 minutes with us, we just saved you four and a half hours. And those notes, maybe it takes you another 10 minutes to read them. So all told, we're going to save you around, say, four hours. If your time is worth, say, $5,000 an hour, like Naval Ravikant's theoretical <laughs> value of his time, maybe yours isn't quite that much, we just saved you. $20,000. So Naval, if you're listening to this, I just saved you $20,000. I expect you to at least <laughs> go leave a review. <laughs> so. uh, if Naval reviews our podcast, I'll be happy. We can just shut it down. I, would I'll feel like I would done. take that to the bank. I would just mm. retire off of that. That would be on my, that'd be on my CV, my resume. That'd be on my LinkedIn bio. Just a screenshot of his review. Naval Ravikant, listen to my podcast. Like two stars <laughs> and like a little sideways face. Yeah. Uh, with with the tongue sticking out. Yeah. He engaged. Well, yeah. I'd be psyched. Okay, so that's going to do it for us, guys. We appreciate you taking some time. Uh, as always, we love and adore you. And um, make sure that you go give your mom a high five. And we'll see you in the next episode. Bye.